Good morning. Welcome, and we are going to continue in our series on uh, studying Christmas trees, looking at various trees that we see in Scripture, and to see how they help us to understand the Christmas story uh, more fully. You know, I, I think for me, uh, when, when I think of Christmas, one of the associations I always have is uh, family. Right, for me, Christmas and family are uh, practically synonymous. We uh, think about family perhaps more this time than we do any other time. Um, oftentimes during the holiday season, we make a special effort to uh, maybe travel to see our uh, family um, and maybe even make time to sp- celebrate traditions with them. You know, and for me, I was thinking about family though this week and, and I, I decided to uh, go on Ancestry.com. Do you know about this website? Probably uh, most of us. Uh, What you can do is you go on Ancestry.com and you enter your kind of biographical information and Ancestry.com cross-references that and helps you to put together your family tree. And I thought it'd be really interesting, but I didn't realize how challenging it was going to be. And so I I gave up after like three generations. Uh, I I only got back to my great, great grandparents on my mother's side, uh, the Reinhardts, by the way, they immigrated from Germany in the uh, late 1800s. But frankly, I just got bored Uh, and I I didn't have the time or the energy to invest. And, and, uh, And I think for me, part of that is because I'm, I'm an American. I'm a modern American, and so really, it doesn't matter what my family tree might look like, right? I think think there's an idea for a lot of us that that when it comes to our ancestral heritage, that, that our job is to do one thing, which is to transcend our predecessors. Uh, even for us as parents, oftentimes we, we want to see our children, and we, we say this, right? We want them to have a life that we never had. And so there's this idea that each progressive generation should be more successful, and we should we kind of chart our own paths and make ourselves into self-made people. But, but I was also thinking about how uh, to an ancient person, that idea would be absolutely preposterous that you could somehow go beyond who your father or your mother was. Uh, In fact, really, for for an ancient person growing up in maybe Jesus' day, your aspirations and your goal and even your job was largely already set before you. Right? Your job, if you were a young Jewish boy, for instance, would be to grow up and to learn the Torah. But uh, unless you were going to be a rabbi, your job was to go pick up your father's trade and perpetuate his line and his legacy. And so if your father was a, an electrician, you would be an electrician. If your father was a, a school teacher, you would be a school teacher because that's how the ancient world worked. And so it's incredibly important to an ancient person, not only who your father was, but also your, your family lineage or your family tree more generally, because that said a lot about you. Uh, in fact, in antiquity, we, we were able to find uh, that uh, the, the historian Josephus, for instance, who was an ancient Jewish historian, he lived uh, roughly around the time of Jesus, somewhere in the, uh, the early first and second century. Uh, and he actually tells us that there were genealogical records that were available for the public to use. And so, so you could, with, with some degree of, uh, of, of uh, uh, it would be fairly easy for you to actually go and figure out back dozens and dozens of generations who your family was and where you came from. You know, and so I, I think about Jesus's story. And in fact, when Matthew, by the way, for your, if you have a Bible, we're going to be in Matthew chapter one this morning. As we look at the Jesus story, I, I have to times, uh, when, I've, when I've heard this preached at Christmas time or uh, other uh, various times, usually the, the Christmas story, uh, in Matthew at least, is, is picked up in chapter 1, verse 18. Now, chapter 1, verse 18 sounds very logical. It says, this is how Jesus the Messiah was born. Doesn't that sound like a very logical way to begin a story about Jesus' birth? And then we enter into the story, right? And it feels very traditional and whimsical where we see the the Magi and Herod and we kind of interpose that with Luke chapter two with the shepherds and the wise men. And it's just just an incredibly nostalgic story. But but what I'm guessing is that in all of your uh, Christmas devotional time or the sermons or stories you've heard about Christmas, my, my guess is that you've rarely focused on verses one through 17. In fact, verses 1 through 17, if you want to just glance down at your Bible, is comprised of a long, and may I just say it, mind-numbingly dull list of names. 
Uh, and in fact, if you've ever read that, you might, be, you might almost look at that as a barrier or some sort, of, some sort of speed bump to keep you from getting to the real Jesus story. And, and my guess is that you've entirely skipped over this passage of God's word in the past. But that means, of course, today, what are we going to do? Uh, we are going to study and, in fact, read the entirety of Matthew's genealogy. And, and I would challenge you, it is going to be arduous for you. It's going to require effort. You will be glad you drank coffee by the time I am done with this. Yet, yet as, as uh, frankly, as bored as we may be, if I may say that, um, a, an ancient Jewish person would have been on the edge of their seat. And they would have expected something, something radical and groundbreaking out of this genealogy. Because, because when we understand the gospel, we cannot understand the good news about Jesus until we understand who he was and where he came from. And, and literally the, the family tree, or sometimes we call it the tree of Jesse, which is Jesus's lineage. And so we're going to read this in all of its glory and we're going to ask ourselves as Christians, what are two lessons we learn out of uh, the family tree of Jesus? And here we go. This is the record of the ancestors of Jesus, the Messiah, a descendant of David and of Abraham. Now, Abraham was the father of Isaac and Isaac was the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez was the father of Hezron, and Hezron was the father of Ram. Ram was the father of Amminadab, and Amminadab was the father of Nahashan. Nahashan was the father of Salmon, or is it Salmon? We will never know. Salmon was the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, and Boaz was the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed was the father of Jesse, and Jesse was the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother was Bathsheba, the widow of Uriah. Solomon was the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam was the father of Abijah. Abijah was the father of Asa, and Asa was the father of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat was the father of Jehoram, and Jehoram was the father of Uzziah. Uzziah was the father of Jotham, and Jotham was the father of Ahaz. Ahaz was the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah was the father of Manasseh. Manasseh was the father of Ammon, and Ammon was the father of Josiah. Josiah was the father of Jehoiakim and his brothers, born at the time of the exile to Babylon. After the Babylonian exile, Jehoiakim was the father of Shealtiel, and Shealtiel was the father of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was the father of Abiud, and Abiud was the father of Elikim. Elikim was the father of Azor, and Azor was the father of Zadok. Zadok was the father of Akim, and Akim was the father of Eliud. Eliud was the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar was the father of Nathan. Nathan was the father of Jacob, and Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. And Mary gave birth to Jesus, who is called the Messiah. All those listed above include 14 generations from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the Babylonian exile, and 14 from the Babylonian exile to the Messiah. So what, what is it that we learn? Uh, what are we to draw from this genealogy as, as Christians, as people who are trying to faithfully follow Christ as disciples, in which I, many of you, I imagine, are? And what I want to point us to is two things I think that we can draw from this list that I really think impact us as Christians. And the first truth about Jesus' genealogy that I want to direct us to this morning is a simple one, but I think it's profound. It is simply this. It's that God can use anybody. You know, when you uh, read through this list, or when I just read it for you, my, my guess is you might have uh, noticed maybe, maybe a half a dozen of names that you recognized. You know, Abraham, probably, uh, David, even King Solomon, um, and, and of course, Mary and Joseph and, and Jesus. But, but I just want to draw us to, first of all, the, the nature of this list, which is for us, uh, particularly as kind of modern, uh, you know, Western people, uh, this is a largely uh, obscure list of names. Like, I'm going to guess that most of you, even if you're a real Bible person, could not tell me much about Zadok and Azor. 
No one is going to rise to that challenge, I see, right? This is, th- these are not people that we've studied in church, right? This was not on felt board Jesus when you were growing up, right? Where you have the story of Ad- you know, Zadok and Azor. Like, we just never, we never studied that. Um, and, and frankly, even, even in, in, when you look at the, uh, the, the records of these people in the Old Testament, many of them have basically the following epitaph. It's that so-and-so lived and they died. Now, we also know to that, we know that they also did one other important thing, which was they had some sort of child that that propagated their name and the lineage. And I find this to be very encouraging, though, because I think many of us, we go through life and we kind of feel like like Zadok and Azor. We kind of have a sense that, that, you know, really we're kind of living maybe an unspectacular life. Uh, Maybe you're kind of to the point yet where you realize you're going to miss out on the front page of history. Have you ever had that sense? Like, I mean, let's be honest. Do I have any like presidents in the room? Has anyone like solved a a very difficult math problem or cured a disease in this room? I probably not, right? I I have that every once in a while. This just feeling, not not, like loathing and self-pity, but like the sense of like, I'm kind of insignificant in the grand scheme of things. You know, the, you know, but what, what I see in this, in this story is something really beautiful. It's, it's that God um, oftentimes works through uh, what, what up appears to us, at least from a human point of view, as uh, insignificant, normal people. Um, and, so, and some of us even, we have to realize that the, the greatest gift we will give to the kingdom is, is the gift of our children. Or perhaps your children's children who will do something incredible for the kingdom of God. You know, we see that, that also, though, uh, when we start to look at the, the broader scope of redemptive history, we actually see that God most of the time works through, uh, quote, insignificant people. And he, he does big things through people who have lived quiet and faithful lives for him. You know, recently I was at a funeral. And uh, this man, I, I didn't know the, the deceased person well, but I knew his son. And so I was going to really support um, him and to, to be a friend and uh, this man's name is Mark, and he, was, uh, he had a life uh, of ministry, and he was the, uh, highly involved at Dallas Christian College. His name's Mark Worley. And, and I, I showed up at this, at this funeral. It was a big church, and, and it was packed, standing room only. Um, and, and it was, again, an incredible service. And, and I, ne- I didn't know this about Mark, but, but almost from the very uh, opening remarks, it, it was shared that, that Mark had a, had, a, had a life motto, that he drew from the scriptures, but also the example of Jesus himself. And it was a simple motto, but it, it changed how he lived his life. And it was really his life's message. And it was so simple. And it was this. And it was that there was no insignificant people in the kingdom of God. God, God works through, through people who, again, who maybe society has looked over who, again, will never show up on the pages of, of history. But, but he started to see in the gospel, uh, he started to see in the life of Jesus, but also even in uh, the, the inherent value of people as image bearers, uh, he came to this beautiful truth that, that really changed his life and was a north star to him that there are no insignificant people in the kingdom of God. And, and sometimes living a life of quiet faithfulness ultimately leads to Jesus being born. Uh, but, but also I notice uh, there, are some, uh, there are some somebodies in this list. Uh, Jesus has a, has a fairly impressive family tree, at least from an ancient Jewish person's perspective. <clears throat> Jesus can trace his lineage back to, among other people, Abraham, uh, who is, of course, the father of the nation of Israel. Uh, he, he, uh, can, he shows how he's a descendant of King David uh, and, and Solomon and really some of the, the big heavy hitters in the Old Testament. Uh, there's also names like Josiah and Hezekiah who are, who are serious players in the story of Israel, in the monarchy, um, and also in the priesthood. These are, these are some incredible names to be associated with. Uh, it, it would be like you being able to trace your, uh, your lineage back to like Abraham Lincoln or something like that. This is, a, this is an important and an impressive list. And, and we do see tied up in these names is, is how Matthew actually sees the nation's history playing out. And he also sees how God works through these types of individuals to ultimately bring his purposes about in the world. And so, so on one hand, there's an obscurity to this list, but on the other hand, this is a very impressive family tree that Jesus gets to claim. And, and finally, uh, the thing I noticed about this list, and this has been uh, noticed by a lot of people, is that this list is a very scandalous list of family ancestors. 
And, and it's almost as though Mark, or Matthew rather, has, has intentionally directed our attention to every skeleton in the closet of Jesus's family ancestry. Right, do you ever have that time where uh, you know, it's Christmas or New Year's or Thanksgiving and your family's gathered together and you're just hoping that that, that is not brought up? Yeah, anyone? Like, like the family drama or, or, or that thing that's happened in our family past, right? And you're just hoping and inevitably like someone spikes the eggnog and it all comes out at Christmas dinner, right? Just my family. Okay, all right, a bunch of, bunch of very holier-than-thou self-righteous people around, I can see. Uh, the reality is Matthew draws us to some, uh, some scandal in Jesus' family. In fact, he draws our attention primarily through the inclusion, which is actually a radical thing that Matthew does, the inclusion of women in the genealogy. Uh, first of all, we, we see uh, the name, well, Abraham. Let's just take Abraham and David for a moment. Abraham is, of course, the father of faith, but he also lied about his wife being his wife, and he basically gave his wife to Pharaoh. Like, not once, but he does this twice. Like, once I can get behind. Like, everyone makes mistakes, but, you know, two times? I don't know. Uh, we, we see that David has an adulterous and uh, murderous affair with, with Bathsheba, has her husband Uriah murdered, and you notice how, how Matthew brings our attention. Hey, remember Solomon? Remember his mom? Remember how she came into the family? Remember what grandpa did to Uriah? It's a serious stain on the family record. Uh, we, we also see the inclusion of, of women, of, of Tamar. Now, Tamar is the, the daughter-in-law of Judah. And this is a story we don't talk about in church a lot. Judah, um, who is uh, going to be one of the tribes of Israel. He's, he's going out and uh, he's on his way basically to Las Vegas in biblical terms, Old Testament terminology. Uh, and he's looking for a prostitute. Now Tamar, his daughter-in-law, knows this and actually disguises herself as a prostitute, sleeps with her father-in-law, and then gives birth to twin boys. Right, again, things that just don't really go over well at the Christmas dinner table, correct? Uh, and yet Matthew draws our attention um, we, we, see, uh, he mentions, um, we, we see he mentions Rahab. Now, it's true that, that Hebrews actually counts Rahab as a part of the hall of faith. And we really have a room, I think, to esteem her. But we have to remember, like, before she made it into the hall of faith, she was turning tricks on the wall of Jericho. Uh, we, we see that Ruth was a Moabite. And Moabite, that again, it's not so good to be a Moabite. Uh, Jewish people don't like Moabites. They, they came from the, also the incestuous union of Lot and his daughters. And so, so we see here that there are some, again, we've got David and Abraham, very impressive. But then we have Uriah's wife, Bathsheba. We have Tamar, we have Ruth. And, and we see how uh, God has brought all these people together, yet out of that family lineage, comes the Messiah and the Christ. Yeah, but I think more fundamentally, because I think we could say God uses anyone and we can trivialize that and sentimentalize that, but I think this shows us a deeper truth. And, and I think really in Jesus's genealogy, we actually see the need for grace. Now, how does this work? Um, notice in uh, verse, uh, chapter one, verse 20, right, uh, Joseph is struggling with accepting Mary as his wife because she's been found to be pregnant. Right? And it wasn't by him. So he's wondering, how is this happening? And the angel assures Joseph that Mary has become pregnant by the Holy Spirit. But then he says this in verse 21. It says, Mary will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Now, who are, who are Jesus' people just on, on the most like, basic level? Jesus' people are his family. Right? His, his, his family line, and we understand that, right? David is called the, or Jesus is called the son of David at times, right? There's this idea that Jesus represents his entire lineage back, all the way back to Abraham and beyond. And, and, the, and, and the angel tells Joseph uh, most fundamentally that, that this Jesus is going to save his people, which means that the best king that we can think of, David, or uh, maybe even scripture tells us, Josiah is the greatest king who ever lived. Hezekiah, a, a hero of the Old Testament. They are in need of a savior. They are in need of God's grace. 
that, that even the people who, who society looked up to with the greatest regard and kind of the highest esteem, uh, they needed something from Jesus. And we also see how, how this story also tells us that, that reformed prostitutes, uh, that, that Moabite women, that, that people who have been uh, traditionally left out of the story are actually brought back into God's redemptive work. Why? It's through God's grace. Right? Notice that, that none of these people end up to be meritous. None, none of these people live perfect lives. In fact, again, we're, we're, we're reminded time and time again of how they fail abysmally. And so the first thing we see is through Jesus and his family tree, we see that, yes, God does use anybody. God does use nobodies. But, but the means by which he does this is always the means of grace. And so, so Jesus' family tree shows us the need for grace right in the middle of the Christmas story because Jesus came to redeem all of those people. He came to save them, which presumably means they couldn't have done it on their own. But the second thing we see in this genealogy is that God can use anything. Now, when you look at how Matthew, uh, at the very end of the genealogy, Matthew actually tells us how we are to understand and to read this uh, long list of names. And he gives us three events, kind of three major sections that we're supposed to kind of frame the story of Jesus uh, through the lens of. And he says the first one is, is, the, uh, the, the, uh, is the section between Abraham and David, then David to exile and exile to Jesus. Now, when we look at the, the characters, particularly of Abraham and David, this is important for us because uh, for, for us, we see them as Bible characters. But from uh, the, the real reading of scripture and especially how an ancient Jewish person would have, would have approached this is they would have actually viewed Abraham and David as both representing covenants that God makes with his people. So if you look back at Genesis 12, for instance, this is the, called the calling of Abraham. God, God appears to Abraham, called Abram at the time, and, and he promises Abraham three things. He says, I'm gonna give you a great name. I'm gonna give you a land. I'm gonna give you blessing. And so we see that there are these three main promises and, and these begin to be fulfilled in the people of Israel, right? Abram becomes Abraham, which actually means great father. Uh, Israel is given a, a promised land, although Abraham doesn't get to see this. Eventually Moses and Joshua lead the people into the promised land. And so we see that God actually moving through the Old Testament, he's fulfilling his covenant with his people. Now, when we fast forward to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7, uh, God enters into a specific covenant with David as well. And for David, it's that he is going to ensure that David's kind of dynasty, that his line of kings will last forever. And he says, there's always going to be a king sitting on your throne from your line. And so we see all those things. And again, these, these covenants really drive the, 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 the narrative and the drama of the Old Testament. But then we finally arrive at the, at the part of, uh, of the section of exile, right? And exile happens because uh, Israel continues to uh, uh, disobey God. They, they continue to fall into idolatry. And eventually, as, as a way to correct Israel, God lets them fall under the power of various other empires, um, earlier in the story, the, the northern tribes are carried away and destroyed by Assyria, and we've never heard from them again. They kind of fade from history. Uh, and the southern kingdom of Judah is eventually swallowed up by the Babylonian Empire. Right? This is the, the exile that we often talk about in Scripture. And we see that the, uh, the vast majority of the population are actually taken from their home, and they're taken to Babylon, and they're left in captivity there. But let's just think about the implications of this, right? If we are God's covenant people, right? God has coven he's, he's promised us a land, and now we're not in the land because we've been taken away to Babylon. We, we don't have a sense of our, of our corporate uh, identity because our, our entire nation has been destroyed and dismantled, right? We, we see all of these promises that are, are still sitting out there, and yet they're now unfulfilled, and now we're wondering what's God going to do? Similarly, for the, the Davidic covenant, the covenant that God makes with David, we, we see that there's a question, right? There are no more kings. And so we're left to wonder as, as Israelites and as Jewish people, we're, we're struggling with where is God in this story? How, how is it that God is going to come through and, and redeem and to be faithful to what he has promised us? It, it would almost be like that movie. You guys remember Red Dawn? Patrick Swayze, right? A few of you, that was the old one. There's a remake. There's a Pat, Red Dawn is this great movie 
set back in the late, late 80s, early 90s. And, and uh, the, the drama of the story is that, is that uh, Cuba and Russia invade the United States. And they end up taking an entire kind of the, the whole Midwest is basically now under Soviet control, which especially in the 80s and 90s was kind of a big deal. And right there, there's, a, there's this question. There's a question, what's, what's going to happen to our nation? How, how are we going to be restored and how are we going to take back what is ours? And this is really the question that the Israelites have in their mind as they're living in exile, as they're, as they're in a place of not just a kind of national crisis, but they're also in a place of spiritual crisis as well. And so we see in this question, in this question like, what, what do we need if we're a people in exile? What is it that the, the people in Babylon are, are, are thinking about and hoping for? And now I think there's a couple of things that we could say, first of all, uh, that the Israelites don't need. Right? So if you're a people living in exile, the first thing you don't need is a good philosophy. You know, there are great philosophies in the world. There are, some are more helpful than others. Uh, you know, for instance, Buddhism, one of, the, one, of the, uh, you know, one of the things that Buddhism tries to account for, it's a philosophy that tries to make sense of suffering in the world. Uh, there's a, a story of how uh, Buddhism was founded and there was a, a rich young prince and he was largely sheltered uh, in his life and his father actually kind of kept him in this kind of this bubble to make sure that he was insulated from the, the real world. And eventually, uh, Buddha goes out and he walks through the streets and he sees uh, four signs. He sees an old man, he sees a, a sick man, and he sees a dead man. And he also sees a man who is um, uh, kind of one of those, the, those aesthetics where he, he would go and he would, they, would, they would kind of beat themselves, right? And so he sees these and these become four signs, which lead to four truths of Buddhism which then lead to the eightfold path. And the whole point of this philosophy is to help us live out a life that is free from suffering. But, but here's, what, here's the problem with that. If you are in exile in Babylon, you can have the best philosophy in the entire world and guess what, it does not change. It does not change the fact that you are in exile. Right? So you can think all the happy thoughts you want, but you walk out and you live in Babylon, not Jerusalem. Right? You, see the, you see the Babylonian gods and the temples to their gods. You, you do not see the altar and you do not see the holy of holies that you go to worship your God, Yahweh. And so you don't need a good philosophy. Now, what I would also say uh, you know, exiles do not need is they do not need good advice. Right? If you think about Job, I, 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 uh, it's, a, it's such a great story where, where Job, right, he's, he's kind of got it all. He's got a great family and a great wife and a bunch of kids. He's wealthier than you can imagine. Like he has like a thousand camels, which I think makes you really rich in Old Testament terms. And, and really in, in the blink of an eye, all of these things are, are taken away. He loses his money. The, the, the camels are taken by foreign bandits or something and his family is killed. And so he, he's sitting there right in the depths of despair, uh, literally like sitting in the dirt and, and he's understandably pretty upset about how his life is going. And then really the, the story comes up and we see three friends arrive and they, they start talking to Job and they start dispensing their spiritual advice to Job. They're like, hey, Job, I know life's pretty tough now, but here, let me tell you why your t life is really tough. Like, isn't that so nice when someone does that? Like, great, my marriage is falling apart. Well, let me tell you why you've contributed to the downfall of your marriage. In fact, they, they say things like this in chapter four. They say, stop and think. Is it the innocent that die? When have the upright been destroyed? My experience shows that those who plant trouble and cultivate evil will harvest the same. Like, is this good? Is this helping Job at the moment? No, uh, it, it's get, it gets worse. In chapter eight, it says, your children must have sinned against God. So their punishment was well-deserved. Could you imagine telling it to someone who had just lost a family member, much less a child? Verse 11, or chapter 11 says, listen, God is doubtlessly punishing you far less than you deserve. Right? These are, th this is the advice of Job's friends. And, and it's packaged in a way where thankfully, I think we're, we're, we're rightly uh, suspicious of this advice. And, and we kind of know that it's sort of trite, spiritual, transactional wisdom that really is not true of how God works. Yet, yet, isn't it true that even if it was true, it wouldn't be helpful? 
Like, does it help an exile to say, hey, let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you have rejected Yahweh through your idolatrous worship and your attachments, and so God is now judging you. It doesn't help. What, what an exile needs is good news. Exiles need to know, not that I have a good philosophy or a way to cope with this. Exiles need to know that I am going home. And in fact, in Ezra chapter one, through uh, what's called the Edict of Cyrus, Cyrus is a new king in town. And it says actually that God moved in his heart and actually led him to begin repatriating Jerusalem. But, but just notice the, 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 the difference. Hey, pain and suffering are transitory. You need to focus your mind and, and have, a, have a different perspective on life. It's like, no, that's, that's not good news. Good news is, hey friend, you're going back to Jerusalem. You're gonna go rebuild the temple. You're gonna to get to go worship Yahweh in his promised land with your covenant people. That, my friends, is good news for an exile. And we see that in, uh, in the New Testament, we see that this idea of exile is very much applied in spiritual terms. Paul views us all as exiles from our heavenly father because of our disobedience and our really failure to accept Christ by faith. And so, so what, the, what the gospels do, and in particular, is they, they pronounce this good news into a, a time of spiritual exile. But also remember, the Romans are, are uh, the new conquering, invading force in the, in the world at this time. And so really, they're back in the same boat. And so it's in this context, and even to a couple of shepherds who are, who are on the outskirts of society, that the angel says, I bring you good news. Not good advice not a good philosophy, good news that brings great joy to all people. You know, John the Baptist needed good news when he was in prison, right? He was locked up by Herod and, and he was struggling. He didn't even know quite what to do with Jesus. He was really faltering in his commitment to Jesus. And so, so John sends his disciples to Jesus and he says, hey, basically, are you the promised Messiah or should we wait for someone else? Like, are you the one who is actually the fulfillment of this good news or is someone else coming? And Jesus says this, he says, the blind see, the lame walk, those with leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is being preached to the poor. John the Baptist needed good news. His life was done. He was going to be executed in a few days. So he didn't need a philosophy or, or, or advice. He needed good news that Jesus was who he says he was. And so, so what do we see here? We, we see that in Jesus's genealogy, we, we see that God can and does use anyone. And he also can use anything to accomplish his purposes. And, and even in Matthew, there's this implicit invitation throughout the gospel of Matthew that you see from the beginning to the very end, which is, right, we're, we're given this family tree of Jesus, and, and at the end, we're also given this incredible invitation to follow Christ as disciples, right? right? To, to be a part of Jesus's family. Who are my father? Who is my mother? Who are my brothers, right? He says, those who do the will of my father. It's an invitation to become part of Jesus's family. And, and really, there are, there are, uh, there's one real struggle, and, and we, we manifest this struggle two different ways when it comes to being a part of Jesus's family. There's two barriers, really, to keeping us um, out of Jesus' family tree. And, and the first problem is that we think we're too good. The second problem is that we think we're too bad. Right? Have you ever talked to somebody about Jesus, or maybe you invited them to church, and they said something along these lines, they said, hey, you know what, that's great uh, that you go to church, but I don't really need church. I, I've heard that a lot. And, and they're, what, uh, they're, they're not trying to be mean or anything, but, but I think that tells us a lot. It says, you know what, when it comes to Jesus, it's great that, like, that Jesus works for you and that he helps you and that you need kind of a, a spiritual crutch to get through life. Uh, but I don't need that. See, I, I figured out a way to have a happy marriage, good job, uh, maybe some, some success that I've been able to largely garner for myself. And, and, and because of all of those things, you know, I think I'm a good person for the most part, not perfect, but pretty good. So if there is a God, surely he's happy with me and I'll get to go to heaven when I die. What, what are you saying? Saying, oh, well, I'm, I'm too good to be a part of the family tree of Jesus. I, I don't need a savior. I've saved myself. I, I have, by that you know, token, I've actually rejected grace. I have said, I have what it takes 
And if God exists, then surely he must be happy with me. Right? It's this idea of saying, I'm too good for Jesus. And that's a barrier to entering into the family. Jesus says, the only way you can become part of my family is to realize who you truly are, to realize you are, are, are suffering from a spiritual sickness that you cannot solve or remedy yourself. But, but on the other hand, some of us, we, we actually have missed out on grace because we have a, a broken self-concept and a broken self-image, right? On one hand, of course, we have the, the, the doctrine of, of depravity, which, which says that, okay, a part of our own spiritual effort, we are dead in our sins. That's true. But, but some of us have taken that and we've, we've created such a, a distorted picture of ourselves to the point where we can never imagine God loving us at all. And you might even be able to affirm that Jesus died for everyone else in the world except for one person. And that one person is you. And it's this way of, of saying, okay, it's similar to how the, the person who's too good says, Jesus, I don't really need you. The person who thinks they're too bad says, Jesus, there's no possible way you could want me. Right? And, and so we have, because of that decision, we've, we've placed ourselves on the outside of Jesus' family. And that's why I think the gospel is, is so important because what does the gospel do? It, it flips the script on both of those people. To the person who says, I'm too good. I've kind of got this on uh, lockdown. I, I'm, I'm taken care of. I don't need Jesus. Uh, Jesus comes to tell us actually, no, not only are you not as good as you think, you're actually way worse than you could have possibly imagined. He says, you, you think you've accomplished something of, of spiritual merit because of, of your own effort? The gospel says, no, that's actually not true. You're, you're actually a, a wretched sinner. You are, in, you, are, you are deserving of the wrath and judgment of God. Merry Christmas. That, that's what the gospel says. And, and it has this way of saying, hey, if, you're, if you think you're a king, if you think you're the founder of the nation, that's great. Guess what? Still really bad news from you apart from Christ. But then what, what happens is that the gospel also does the same thing, except the opposite to the person who has a broken self-concept and, and a low self-esteem, thinking that God possibly could never possibly love me. God says to that person, no, I actually love you more than you could have ever possibly imagined. I created you in, in my image. I, I, I entered into humanity through uh, the incarnation of the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ. Who, who lived a, a, the life that you should have lived and who died the death you deserved, right? And, and, and you have to ask yourself, would God go to that effort for someone that he did not love? And so what does the gospel do? The gospel says you are more, uh, you are more sinful and wretched than you could possibly imagine. And you are also more loved and accepted than you ever could have thought. And we see that example in Jesus himself where Jesus tells us that we are in, in need of him, but also that he loves us and he laid his life down so that we would be saved. But then there's the question of how, how do we also, if that's, if that's one of the barriers for um, allowing God to work through anyone, what, how, how do we allow God to redeem our circumstances? And I'll just say this briefly in conclusion, that, that in Christmas time, I, I think many of us are, are reminded more than ever uh, about what's going wrong in your life. I'll bet right now, if you have a challenge at this time of year, it's actually magnified. If you're struggling financially, you're really struggling financially. If you have, if you have marital issues, I'm going to guess they're right now probably worse than usual. Right? You, you can extrapolate that out. I, I do think we come to uh, Christmas time, and, and just as the prophet Isaiah says, it's, it's like we're walking in a great darkness. And I think this is true, and this is not just kind of feel-good spiritual wisdom, but it is true. We, we experience pain and brokenness in our lives, and sometimes we're in that position of asking, like, okay, how on earth is God going to redeem this? Because I'm sick, someone's died, I'm poor, I'm unhappy, whatever it might be. And we ask ourselves, okay, how could God possibly get me out of this one? much less do something amazing with it. And, and let me just sh share with you, this is exactly the position, this is exactly the, the stage that is set when Christ enters the scene. The people walking in great darkness, they, what, they see a great light. 
And so I want to challenge you today to wherever you're going through at the moment, I want to invite you to say, okay, how can, how can this situation ultimately shine a light to Christ? And how can my present situation ultimately tell a story of, of good news that brings joy to all people? And so remember, God can use anyone and God can use anything. Uh, and that's why I think the genealogy of Jesus matters. Let's bow and pray this morning. God, we thank you for uh, this incredible story, the story of Jesus' birth. And uh, even today, many of us, myself included, uh, would acknowledge that, uh, that oftentimes we've skipped over this part of, of the incarnation of Jesus. Um, many because, times because it's, just, it's, it's confusing and it doesn't really speak to our cultural context. Uh, but God, today we're so grateful that we can be uh, focused and attentive to this part of your word, um, literally the beginning of the good news of Jesus. And so God, today help us to help us to, to see the hope and the joy that we have in, in this family. God, we're grateful that you truly can and do use anyone. Uh, sometimes through, um, you know, uh, the front page uh, news and issues and um, through um, great triumphs, but also sometimes through quiet, faithful lives. We're grateful that there are no insignificant people in the kingdom of God. Also, God, we're grateful today that you can use anything, particularly exile and life's disruptions to, to do something incredible and to, uh, to shine even more brighter the light of Jesus. And so God, today, as we get ready to uh, this last final stretch before now in our celebration of the birth of Jesus, would you help us to, um, to live out a, a lives that, that are representative of being a part of your family? Help us to recognize our, uh, the, the love that you have for us, but also our need for, for Jesus. Help us also to, to look into our own lives and to, to see how uh, we could do better to allow the gospel to permeate our circumstances. God, we're so grateful though that we can do all of these things because of Jesus. It's in his name we said, amen.